anybody does end up having problems, uh, please let us know so that we can help you debug your situation. Go ahead and share my screen. Uh, yes. Okay, good. So uh, we're gonna work on the Metasploit section right now. Uh, again, you don't have to if you don't want to, but it is a good thing to learn how to use. Uh, it's sort of the, I would say one of the one of the real bread and butter tools in our toolkit of uh, of attack and exploitation. Um, Metasploit's a it's a framework for uh, that's designed just for exploitation. Uh, a company by the name of Rapid Seven uh, started this and, and maintains it. And one of the cool things about it is that it's um, a platform where you can write your own exploits for it and. Um, a lot of different developers uh, write things and then upload them. So you've got a really, it's a really powerful tool because you've got a ton of different uh, options available for exploitation. So let's go ahead and start with the very first one, the Metasploit uh, versus ActiveMQ uh, project. That's going to be uh, 310 here. So if we go ahead and start that, we can, uh, let's check out our, our virtual machines. So. Uh, earlier, I was saying, you know, it's important to be, that you be able to ping between your two machines. Um, one thing I noticed when I was setting these up is that if you are, um, if you're running on Google Cloud uh, platform right now and you're using that, uh, make sure that your machines are both under the same project so that they end up on the same local network because Took me a minute. I had mine under different projects. And I'm like, ah, oh, why are they? Why do they have the same IP address? Well, that's why. So uh, make sure that they're on uh, under the same project. If you were using locally hosted VMs, you might have to look, do a little bit of tinkering with the network settings on your hypervisor just to make sure that um, they're both on the same local network and that you can ping between your machines. So as you can see here. Um, I pulled my IP address, which in uh, Debian you're going to be using IPA, and uh, to get that uh, in Windows, it's good old uh, IP config to get it. Um, you, and when you do that, you're going to want to look at the uh, IPv4 address right here. Uh, that's going to be on your your uh, your Ethernet interface. So in in the case of my Linux cloud VM, it's going to be 10.128.0.3. And then in my Windows VM, let me make this a little bigger here. Let's scroll up in the window so you can see it. Um, I'll just run it again because I ran it earlier. Um, I'll run it here. You can see it's going to be this. Uh, this line right here for the IPv4 address. So for my Windows machine, it's going to be uh, a dot two address. So as long as you can ping between the two, you should be good. Um, again, if you're, you need help with that, let us know and we will help you out. So once you've got your machines pinging between each other and they can hear each other okay, uh, first thing we need to do uh, after that is to make sure that we uh, turn off our Windows firewall protections. Um, and you'd think, well, nobody's, who's, who's going to be silly enough to do that? People do it. Uh, so it leaves, it does leave these, it does leave some machines vulnerable to um, exploitation. And you're about to see why. Uh, if you have any kind of, if you work at a, a job where you're working for a corporation or say, like, I have a friend who works for a county government uh, in uh, in security, and they sometimes have a hard time, uh, find, you know, getting buy-in from upper levels. And one of the most powerful things you can do is uh, a nice little live demo like this, just to you know scare them a little bit. So first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, turn off our firewall so that we can. Um, make sure that we're, we're able to make our exploits work. So 
Uh, if you're following along with the instructions, uh, what we did here was we just went down into the uh, search bar and typed in firewall to bring up those settings. And then after that, we're just gonna follow the prompts and make sure that we can uh, uh, change our settings. Now I'd had these uh, turned off earlier and I put them back to defaults just so that I could show you, um, just so that I could show you uh, how, how I'm doing that. So, um, So we're going to click, I'm going to click on turn Windows firewall on or off here on the left panel. And then I'm going to do what it says on the tin and turn them off. Now it's going to yell at you when you do this, but that's okay. Uh, just go ahead and do it anyway. And you can see after you've successfully turned them off, uh, these icons turn red over here and they're like warning uh, this is horrible don't do it they're not wrong if you want to return it to default later uh, you can go back and click this button here on the right that says use uh, use recommended settings with the Windows Defender logo okay so now we have done that large this just a little bit so that we can get out of there I'm only using one screen right now, which makes it a little more challenging. And then after we have, uh, after we have turned our firewall off, uh, next thing you're gonna have to do is uh, go to uh, install Java and um, Apache. So uh, one thing that is gonna make your life a lot easier, and I should have informed you about this earlier, but I just remembered it. One thing that's going to make your life a lot easier is if instead of using Edge, uh, you use Firefox and Chrome. Um, and Edge will, I noticed that uh, a lot of the time, uh, Edge will block you from downloading Chrome unless you're tricky about it. So uh, just go ahead and go get Firefox if you don't already have it installed on your Windows machine. Uh, go ahead and get that and um, Make sure that you get that installed. Questions, maybe. Uh, yep. Firefox. Okay. Yeah. What section? My Windows VM on the cloud. It only had Explorer. Right. Right. So you're going to have to go ahead and install Firefox. Yeah. Um, what section am I on? I'm on the uh, installing Java section and installing Apache section of uh, H310. Thanks, Caitlin, for putting that up. Getting the getting the, getting the machines configured can be that can take a minute. So. Uh, as long as you can get Firefox installed, getting these other two installed shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, Edge has a lot of insane checks where anytime you have to, you try to do anything, uh, it'll pop up uh, a bunch of pop-up windows and pretty much essentially try and stop you from using the internet. Uh, one of the funniest things to me about Edge, I don't know if this is still the case because I avoid it like the plague, but one of the funniest things to me about it was when it first came out, um, I had to use it for some reason or another. I can't remember why. Uh, it blocked everything, including links to Microsoft's own documentation on its own site, which really blew my mind. It was like, okay, you're telling me that uh, your own documentation hosted on your own corporate site is malicious and I shouldn't go there. Okay. <laughs> I think you're forgetting the A part of the CIA triad, which is uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So hopefully everybody is able to get uh, Fire Firefox going, keep getting download errors. Yep. Um, I imagine you're getting, I, I imagine Edge is yelling at you. Is that the case? Uh, it's, it's not Edge. I wish it was, I wish it was Edge. It's Explorer 11 and I can't get to, I get to the site, but I can't download. It's blocking me. It says not on the trusted site. 
do you remember where that is? Like to add it to the trusted site. So oh, 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 up. wait, are you on the cloud? Yeah. Okay, so um, you need to disable the um, the IE what it has security thing. Oh, please guide me. So yeah. uh, go yeah, click start server and server settings or something, and it's uh, yeah. Uh, go to server manager. Server manager. Oh, yeah. There you go. So do I want to be on a Google page or I want to be within the server? Within, within the, the server. server. Okay, uh, and then go down to your start. Okay. In and the then, lower yeah. left hand corner, type server manager. Okay, and that's yeah. already up. Okay, so go into local okay. server. Okay. There. And, uh, it's right, it's on the on the right hand side. It says IE enhanced something or other. Yeah. Security configuration. Uh I'm not seeing it. You have to where scroll to the right. Is, feedback and, and diagnostics. There, IE enhanced security configuration. You have to turn that off. Right in the middle of the screen. Yeah. Okay, I see it. Yeah, so you click on the where it says on. And then you set those to off. Then, right. then you need to close Internet Explorer and open okay. it up again and it'll give you something new that says the enhanced security is off. And now you can download another browser and do all kinds of stuff like you normally would. All right, thank Sorry you. Sorry that I butted in, Liz. No, glad you did, glad you did. Um, I should, you know, I forgot to mention that. Uh, I turned it off earlier and that was, that was why I reset all my security settings to default so I could walk through it with you, but uh, I missed some, it's always possible. Um, and I imagine somebody else was having that problem because they do not make it easy to put another browser uh, on your Win10 machine. Um, was everybody able to get that process underway? Ah, yeah, see, I knew it. Somebody had the same issue, I'll bet. And I'll bet you two weren't the only one, so I'm glad. Uh, Glad you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned that. So um, once, you, once you get that going and you're able to get uh, Firefox downloaded, then you can really, then you can really have some fun. Uh, Liz, I'm getting a question in private chat that I think affects more than one person. They don't know how to get the RDP file and connect to the Windows Cloud oh, server. So okay. you might show them that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that's actually, um, you know, I get the, that that's an issue for a lot of folks. So. Um, you know, we, there are m multiple ways that we can get in to our, um, there are multiple different ways we can get in. Uh, I like, I'm, as you can see, I'm using the RDP client as well. Um, uh, and to do that, console here to do that, it's, they actually make this pretty nice and easy. So. Um, if you go to your, um, I don't know why this is taking forever, but if you go to your console, to your dashboard on uh, Google Cloud, and you see your projects right here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to my compute engine here, uh, listed under resources, that's got my project in it. Then... The password is coming up. It's not the Google Cloud password. She'll show you where the password is. Right. So you will just go ahead and um, now it may be different depending on your host system. But for me, all I needed to do, I'm using a Mac right now. All I needed to do was click on this. Oops, sorry. All I needed to do was click on this. Uh, um, drop down menu here uh, on the right next to where it says RDP and then choose the third option here which is download the RDP file and then when you do that it will uh, be downloaded directly to your machine I also have this like Google Chrome plugin thing that uh, 
allows you to not need the to download the RDP file and use a separate client, but I didn't really like it, so I'm probably going to uninstall it. Um, this is just sort of an easier way to go. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, if it didn't, let me know. Um, and then once you go to connect, it will ask you, uh, it will ask you for the login and password and the login and password you're going to use are the ones that you set uh, for that cloud windows machine. So um, if your login name is student and your password is potato, uh, just for that specific virtual machine for that windows virtual machine, that's what you're going to enter in the field uh, in your RDP client when it asks you for credentials to connect. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's okay. I am gonna like hold my horses here for a second because if more than one person had that question, then I'm guessing that not everyone's up and connected and able to ping between both of their machines. So I'm gonna hold off for a second just to make sure folks can get uh, just to make sure folks can get up to speed. So one thing that's kind of interesting about Metasploit is uh, it's pretty popular. I mean, I've seen it in uh, more than one TV show or movie about hackers. And the one that come the the one that comes to mind immediately is Mr. Robot, like his his uh, zero day exploit against the FBI or whatever was actually a, it was actually a Metasploit module. So. It's kind of funny and interesting. So hopefully you're able to uh, get your machines up, get Firefox installed on your Windows machine and ping between your Windows and your Linux cloud VMs. If you are ahead of the game and you're already to those points, all those things are working, go ahead and follow the next step in the instructions, which is to install Java and to install ActiveMQ. Those are the links to both of those are uh, right here in the instructions themselves. They're really small downloads, so this only should take a second. Awesome. Okay. Once you uh, then once you download those those files, you'll just extract them and run the setup installer utility for each one. Hey, I didn't get a, a um, Apache Active Bin window to open. I don't know what that is. I'm sorry, could you say that again, please? Is it the folder that's supposed to open? Uh, well, for uh, Java, no. no. Not the Java, it says open your browser and open a downloads folder, right click and extract all. Yeah. And I did, and I extracted, but all I got was a folder, a window, and you know, a Windows Explorer folder with the Apache Apache folder in it. Right. So once you do that and you open it, there should be a, an. Ins Let me look. Let me bring mine up. I believe. Bar, I believe there's a. Thing. Sure. Let me uh yeah, there's no installation for active MQ. Here. All you do is unzip the folder. Perfect. Okay. I, I did that part and then it says um it opens and then it says from the menu bar bar, bar click file open. So after I do the folder, then I go into the, the command prompt. That's all it's telling me. Yeah, that's right. You run it from all the right. command prompt. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully folks are getting, are able to make that part happen. Let me know if you're having any problems. We will get you sorted out. Let's see, I've got a couple more questions here. Uh, yep. Okay. And as you can see, once you once you've got Firefox going, it's easy to it's easy to uh, 
download the dependencies you need. So next thing I'm going to do, um, and if I'm going too fast, let me know. I'm trying to, trying to be, uh, go at a good pace. Um, next thing you're going to do is open your command prompt. If it's not already open, uh, again, you can do that just by uh, clicking in the start area or the search area and type CMD and it'll come up right away. Uh, once you've got that up there, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to execute these commands right here to start active MQ. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, change directories to get in there. Let me make sure that it's still in the right place. Oh, latency, good times. Okay. Where even am I? I did it by opening the download file in the GUI and then opening the command prompt from there. That gets oh. you close to the right place. Yeah, that's a good idea because because the path, the directory paths are kind of screwy uh, on on the cloud machines. Let's They're a little different. Time. We have a question. Yeah, no, I was just looking. It looked like somebody had a question. There's no Firefox on the server. Do we have to install that with Java as well? Yes, uh, Firefox is the First thing you're gonna wanna do. Now, uh, you're gonna run into problems when you try to install that, as Urban pointed out, unless you change some settings here inside your, uh, inside your security settings. So uh, before you can download Firefox, uh, where was it in the, let's see. Server manager. Yeah. Before, yeah, so I'm going to go over this one more time uh, for you. Um, so when you go to install Firefox, first thing you're going to have to do is go over here to your, um, to your local settings. And then uh, it is kind of buried here in the middle. Thank you again for pointing that out, Urban. Um, you're going to have to go over here uh, and uh, go over to where... too far down yeah so you're gonna go to the the middle and then go to uh, ie enhanced security configuration right here in about the middle of the pane and you're gonna go ahead and turn that from on to off so when you turn that off you ought to be able to download and install uh, Firefox Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what happens with the folder. He says he can only open PowerShell. Let's see yeah. what happens. Mm. Go ahead and just open downloads and then file. Oops. What you, I'm sorry. What did you say, Sam? How did you get? Yeah. So, can what happens if you click file in this window? Open downloads first. Yeah. And then click file up there. Is there a command prompt or is it just a PowerShell? There's a command prompt right there. I don't have command prompt on mine. It only probably, shows me PowerShell. Yeah, probably because you have um, 2019. Or something. I think you can just use PowerShell and it'll be fine. I think, okay. so. I think that'll work. Yeah, just use PowerShell. Okay. 
So, I'm going to wait for a second since some folks are still um, getting caught up on the installations. I think we have a question here. Yeah. Sorry, I just get to local server. What'd you do there? Oh, no problem. It's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to see it. I'll uh, pull it up again here. Um, so we go to server manager and then we go to local server here and then go over to the middle column I'm sorry, uh, not the middle, but it's the one on the right. Go to the middle of the right column where it says IE, Enhanced Security Configuration, which is like five, six settings down. Go ahead and turn that from on to off. That way uh, it won't keep stopping your downloads when you try to download Firefox. Once you change that setting and get it turned off, you should be able to download Firefox without a problem. Once you get Firefox going, you should be able to start uh, downloading. You should be able to uh, download Java and ActiveMQ. And I'm going to give you a second to do that just so that we're all you're able to follow along. Find I enhance. I'm sorry, I cannot see your screen. Um, oh, I took it down. Just turn it off. Internet enhanced. I'll bring it up again. Are you still not able to see my screen? right here. Uh, no, all you need to do is turn off this right here, IE enhanced security configuration. Just turn that to off. That should be all you need to do. <clears throat> It'll be on. And then uh, just switch both of these to off. and click OK. And then you'll need to restart after you do that. After you switch both of those buttons to off, you'll need to restart the browser before the uh, settings take effect. Okay, so I just asked those two are the administrators and users because I not, cannot see the screen. Um, is no one is are people still not able to see my screen? Oh, I got I, for some something happened to the share. Thanks for letting me know. 
Can you see it now okay, Trisa? Oh, it's better? Okay. Good. Show you again right where it is. So, yeah, right here. So, you'll set both of those to off and then click OK. Okay. So next, next what you're going to want to do is follow the instructions to install uh, Java and ActiveMQ. Right here. So just go ahead and open up Firefox or I, I guess you got to install Firefox. Once you've got Firefox installed, um, go ahead and get those in. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Uh, somebody asked if the R host is for the Windows IP. Yes, it is. Good question. L host is going to be for your Linux IP, since that's your local host. And then R host is remote host, and that's going to be your attack target or your Windows machine in this case. Okay. Now, we're in our downloads folder inside of our command prompt here on our Windows machine. Uh, if I execute uh, the directory command dir, I can see whatever's inside my downloads folder right here. And The resolution's a little wonky on here. Let me clear this and do it again so I can. Well, now you can see everything that's inside that downloads folder. As you can see right up here at the top are both the zip file and the extracted file from the uh, Apache MQ, Active MQ uh, download that we did. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna change directory. And we're going to head right on into that uh, Apache folder that we've extracted. So now we're in here. Let's see what's in there. Everything looks good. Uh, next, now that we're inside of there, uh, let's go ahead and start that up. So we're going to type this series of commands in.
You got a CD again. There's another Apache directory. Yeah, thank you. And tab completion will do it. I just noticed that. Yeah. Okay, let's try that again. Okay. There we go. That's what you should be seeing. Got our server started. Okay, so that's running as expected. It will run through all this uh, as it starts up. So next, after we've got that running, we've got our firewall turned off, got everything going. The next thing we're going to do is head back over to our Debian box. Need to set Java home for 2016 servers. Hmm. Okay. I didn't have to, just the default install did it, but yeah. anyway. I I didn't have to either. Um, is it throwing you an error, student K? Hmm. Uh, it, it just automatically installed for me. Uh, that might be a path. Well, student K, why don't you like post a screenshot in the chat or something? Let me see what you got. I'm going to go ahead and keep going and we can, yeah. we can come back to this too. If, yeah. if anybody needs me to go over anything again, no problem. Yeah. I think we'll have to resolve the issues one-on-one. -on -one. Yep. So uh, next and feel free to interrupt me if multiple people are having the same problem too, or even if not, that's fine too. So this part is maybe just a slight bit annoying <laughs> because okay. you've got to type in. Uh, well, sorry, go ahead, Sam. No, student K is fine, it turns out. Good, okay. Okay. So this part is just slightly a bit annoying because we've got to type in like a ridiculously long URL. There are ways around this, but in the interest of brevity, I'm just going to go ahead and do the long, painful uh, type in process right here. Why can't you just copy and paste? Uh, because it doesn't work between my host and guest machine. I can. Um, it does. My, if you... Well, it doesn't for my Google Cloud. It does for my local hypervisor. But for some reason, I'm unable to do it between uh, host and cloud guests. Oh, I can. Uh, I was just able if to. You know I a trick. Copied it and then paste it and use Control V on the. Yeah, Control V or Command V. You're using a Mac. Yeah. The copy, uh, you use Control V or Command V. There. I tried that, and it, for some reason, it doesn't work for me. Try the the Please. gear on the top right, the gear on oh. the keyboard little icon. Oh, there, there it goes. There it goes. Yeah, it, with, it actually worked with Command this time, so that's yeah. awesome. Because yeah. I, yeah. Good. I've been struggling along with not working, so. Good. Thank you. Yep. That saves some time. So, uh, you know, we talked a little bit earlier. Um, uh, Caitlin was talking about uh, wget and curl. Um, curl just stands for uh, client URL. So it does essentially the same thing as uh, wget. And then all we're doing is we're taking uh, the data that we get from that URL and sending it into a folder. Uh, that we've designated here uh, called uh, MSF inst. So if we hit enter, uh, it goes really fast. As you can see, uh, it goes directly into that folder there. Um, if we were to look at our, to look, we can see, uh, awesome, we've got a, we've got a folder here where it's installed. Next thing we need to do is enable the permissions on that folder so that we can go, so that we can um, install the contents there. We'll take that. 
go ahead and execute that command and then that sets the proper permissions there. Uh, the next thing that we're gonna do is type in this line uh, to run the installation script. And it will install. Takes a minute, it unpacks on its own. Mine is probably angry at me because I already have it installed. So I'm just going to end that process right there. Oh, wait, there it went. So uh, it, you'll see at the bottom here, it says run MSF console to get started. So remember that because we're going to do it here in a little bit. Uh, next thing we need to do is install NMAT. If it's not already, I think you're already installed. Uh, so we're going to skip that. It should be installed from an earlier project. So if it is, you don't, obviously you don't need to reinstall it. If you haven't installed it, um, go ahead and do that. But most of you should already have it installed. So next thing we're going to do is grab this line right here. And as you can see, following uh, the nmap commands and flags here, uh, we've got uh, our port number designated here as the last flag. Following that, you've got an IP address. Now you don't wanna use this IP address that's here in the example. Uh, instead, what you're gonna wanna use is the IP address for your Windows target machine. So, Go ahead and plug this line in here. We're gonna run that and then we're gonna enter our Windows IP, okay? So for me, that's gonna be my Windows local network IP address. And then we're gonna go ahead and run that scan. Might take a minute to complete. Cool. So as you can see, it's completed the scan here and it shows us that there's an open service here on this, on this port, on uh, port 8161, which is the port that we gave it to look for. Now, we don't have to give it a port. It will uh, run against all the different ports. The only reason that we did it in this place is because uh, we know what port we're looking for. Um, we know what port we're looking for that service on. Uh, so it makes it a, a little, simpler and easier and cleaner uh, to just get the one that we uh, were looking for specifically. Uh, just for an example, if I were to remove that port flag and run that scan, first off, it's gonna take a little bit longer to complete because uh, it's gonna be running through all of the different ports looking to see what's available. And then as you'll see in a second, the output is going to be significantly more, um, it's gonna be significantly uh, larger <laughs> than what you have when you're just passing it one port to run. I will be right back while that runs. Step away for just a second, and I'll be right back in us. I'll be right back in like two minutes, so don't go anywhere. All right, go take care of that crime. No crime, just a bio break. I meant you know stop the crime in your neighborhood.
as you can see, the other scan is completed here, and it gives us uh, every uh, service that's, that we can, every relevant service running on open ports. But we're only just interested in the one. So uh, next thing we're going to do is what we're going to do is take Metasploit and then look for that specific service and see if, okay, there's going to be some vulnerabilities. So what do you have available for me? So as you remember, if you recall, when we set up Metasploit, um, it tells you after the install completes to run an MSF console to get started. So uh, now's as good a time as any. Let's go ahead and do that. So once that loads up, you should see a shell a prompt. Great. So we have a MSF5 prompt right here which uh, we know that it's successfully launched. So uh, since we know that our uh, vulnerable service on our Windows machine is ActiveNQ, what we can do is go ahead and search right here to see if there are any uh, vulnerabilities and exploits inside the Metasploit database. So let's go ahead and try that. Lag is fun. <laughs> okay, so, oh, look, we've got some, uh, we've got some fun stuff in there to try. Um, so, we're running a specific version of uh, Apache MQ. Let me make this a little bigger so it's hopefully resizes a bit and it's easier to see. No, okay, might just be taking a minute. Um, you can see down at the bottom here, this last one, one of these is specifically uh, claims that it's going to work on the version that we're using. So as you can, as you can see, let's, let's try that one, that specific one out since we know it's for the right version. So. Uh, go ahead and take this next line here uh, and plug that in. Okay, so what happens there when you say when you choose um, when you choose that specific exploit? What you're doing is you're grabbing the uh, directory of it, which is inside of Metasploit, which is their exploit database because uh, they have different types of modules. Like you can see up here, they have auxiliary modules um, and they also have exploit modules. It'll take you to um, the exploit modules. And then here we are getting uh, Windows specific exploits, uh, then gets down even more granular. We're going to uh, web servers and then uh, you get the specific exploit title for the, the uh, vulnerability that we're attempting to attack. And all you have to do to load those, that specific exploit is uh, use the command use followed by that exploit title. So as you can see, after we entered that command, we were, our shell, uh, our shell changed just a little bit, just as, as it does when you change directories inside of uh, a command prompt it changed so that it shows us what exploit that we currently have loaded up in MSF console. So if you go ahead and uh, you, you see that it's loaded up, you don't really know what it can do yet. So let's see, let's see if there's some different configurations or different options. Let's see what we can do with it. So to do that, the, basically the equivalent of the man page, is uh, type in show options. Oh, cool. So this, this gives us different uh, arguments uh, that we can pass to that exploit. So um, it looks like here you can, uh, it gives you some different options of how you can configure it. So we're not gonna use all of these, but we are gonna use uh, a few of them specifically and especially um, 
we're going to use, uh, we're, we got to tell it where to go. So if you go down here to this next line, you can see that we're going to set this our hosts option right here. Somebody asked a good question earlier. Uh, what is that our host variable? Well, that is what designates your attack target. So in our case, we're going to be using the IP address for our Windows machine. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's do set our hosts. And then type in our Windows IP address. And you can see here that it's gone ahead and set that value for us. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one and set our local host, which is our Linux machine that we're typing on right now. Oh, and by the way, you had to install this and set it up. If you're using, if you're a Kali user, um, you, this comes built in. You don't have to do anything like that. So now we're going to set our local host and uh, let's go ahead and enter the address of our Linux machine. Cool. So now let's set our local hosts. There's some chatting. I'm getting that it's already installed. Yeah, it is possible that it's already installed. Um, Okay, so now that we've entered our um, now that we've entered our local host and our remote host, let's go ahead and launch the exploit. To do that, all we need to do at this point is type exploit. As you can see, it's uploading our payload. Okay, here it opened a shell for us. In a second, you will see that we'll get a prompt. We should be seeing it now, but lagging a little bit. There we go. So, doesn't look like a uh, doesn't look like a Linux prompt, does it? You can see right here that we can see the directory of the Windows machine that we're currently using. So that's pretty cool, right? So now you can go here and see what's running. Let's try it. Oh, cool. Here you can see the process ID of the Java that's running. Okay, I see a lot of messages in chat here, so I'm going to pause for a second. Um, I get a different result for Nmap. Uh, make sure that you're using the right IP address. You don't want to use the IP address that's in the instructions. Yeah, correct. To find the IP address of your Windows machine, just, just type ipconfig inside of the command prompt. So now I have shown you how to get that first flag. So that one's a giveaway for you. Pretty fast and easy and simple. In fact, the first time I saw how easy and simple it was, I was a little bit sickened by it. Now you can see why teenagers are 
able to hack big and impressive things. Um, okay, uh, know why I would get a no tasser running, which match the specified criteria. Criteria interesting. So uh, make sure that you're um, entering in this sequence the right way. Yeah, try that too. That might bring up everything for you. Yeah. Try that and see if it works, Josh. Hmm. That is interesting. Okay, so does anybody have any more questions about this section, uh, this particular problem specifically? Great. Wonderful. Okay. Oh, yep. Sam's making a good point there. Okay, so um, it seems like everybody's doing pretty good on that. I'll give anyone who still needs a second. Yeah, it is a common problem with Java and there are so many problems with Java, but uh, we still use it and a lot of things still rely on it. So hopefully everyone was able to at least get this one. If anybody's still struggling with it, um, let us know. If not, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next section. Yeah, that's a good question. How would you get the SAM file? Uh, you need a um, interpreter shell for that. And I don't think you get it with this exploit. If you, if you get a interpreter shell, you then do get system and uh, hash dump. Yeah. But uh, with a command prompt like this, you don't get that. So you're going to have to load more malware on the system. Mm-hmm. Yes, Chiracel, this is why people don't want Java on your machine. Java on the client side machines is very dangerous. It's better than it used to be. But until five years ago, Java was just a wide open door. Now there are a few defenses, but it's still pretty unsafe to run Java on client machines. Also really hard to maintain because, you know, it's, there's just con stuff constantly breaking on it and uh, a lot of compatibility issues. And there's a bunch of platform independent uh, malware. Caitlin, Caitlin, Caitlin made the best point of all. <laughs> you, yep. you get rid of Java so you can keep your sanity. She's absolutely right. It is very painful to install Java. Very often you have the wrong version or multiple versions installed. Many of my students suffer greatly with Java. Handler failed to bind. It might be that you already have something on that port. Oh, no, it probably means you've got the wrong IP address. Oh, yeah, you're using the public IP address. You have to set L hosts to your, um, yeah. to your Linux IP address. You're, 10, yeah. you're just starting with 10, mm. not the one starting with 35. Yeah, because. Uh, uh... Well, check your set L hosts value, CJH. Let's see what this one is, H311. Okay, H311. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, you yeah, this gonna... looks good. Oh, yeah, that's we're right. Gonna... Exploit completed, but no session was created. We'll, we'll do that one right now, actually. That's Vuln server. Okay, good, yeah, good. We're gonna do this one. We're gonna start on this one right now. I just wanted to make sure that everybody 
I just wanted to make sure that everybody, um, oh, I think it was cause I think it was when he, I think he was trying to like pwn the, uh, the federal agents androids or something like that. If I recall, um, his zero day exploit was in this. So, um, if everybody's cool, we're going to go ahead and move on to this section right now. Um, you know, the painful part's done, which is the setup and the tinkering and getting your networking uh, set and everything like that. So, Java. That was actually the most, one of the less painful job installs I've had to do. Um, okay. So, Let's go ahead and do this next one. So first step we already did. You don't have to do it again because we already did it in the last section where we turned off the firewall. Um, but again, if you're, if you're doing these, make sure that you did that because you're gonna have a bad time. Now, we do need to turn off uh, an additional, um, we do need to turn off an additional setting uh, which is called data execution protection in Windows. So um, if you go into your Windows VM here, and you bring that up, you're gonna open up your uh, control panel. Oops, open up your control panel here. Get it down. Eventually it will open, promise. Open that up, go look at our settings here. And we're going to go into system and security. And what was it again? Uh, yeah, system, that's right. System and then uh, advanced system settings. One thing that drives me insane about Windows is having to do all this stuff through the GUI. I'm sure there are ways to do this through the command line, but okay, so we go here and then um, we click on the advanced tab up here at the top. Once we get into the advanced tab we go down to the performance field here and click settings uh, now that we have uh, the settings tab open um, then we the performance options box here somewhere data execution it's the third tab so data execution prevention um we've got uh two options here it used to be you used to be able to just turn it off uh but they have changed that to where now you can just turn it on for only essential uh windows programs and services so go ahead and do that and then once you do you're going to click OK. You're going to click OK again and get out of those dialog boxes here because um, it will not let you. Now they've changed it so you cannot close one thing without closing all the dialog boxes. And then uh, you just get all the way out of there. Too many windows here. Way too many windows. Once you get out of it, um, go ahead and restart your Windows server for all that to take effect. So I'm gonna give you a second to restart and get connected before I continue. Oh, it's hard to see again how I got to uh, depth. No problem. I can uh, I can go ahead and show you that again. It is hard because they nest these things like a million layers deep in here, and it's super counterintuitive. So uh, let's go in here and go back to our control panel. Open that up. 
loose here. And we're gonna go into, first when we open our control panel up, we're gonna go into system and security. And then we're gonna go into uh, system. Once we get inside of system, then we're gonna click on advanced system settings over here on the left tab. And then the next thing we're gonna do is click on advanced tab inside of the systems properties. And once we do that, we can see there are three fields here. We're gonna go for the top one, this performance field and click on settings inside of that performance field. Once we get into there, as if we weren't already nested deep enough to change this one settings, we're gonna click on the third tab, which is data execution protection, which is the setting we actually finally wanna change. So once we get in there, uh, you're gonna, it's typically you're going to have the second radio button selected, but you want the first one selected, uh, which is turn on uh, data execution protection for essential windows and programs only instead of for everything. Um, you can, uh, you can uh, change and if, if you do want to, you can selectively uh, create an allow list uh, here, uh, but we're not, gonna, we're not gonna bother to do that for the purposes of this exercise. Once you have that, that radio button selected, just click okay, then click okay again until you get out of there. Um, and then finally, once you've got those change those settings changed okay um you're going to want to restart your cloud uh you're going to want to restart your uh windows machine awesome okay and we'll give that a second to reboot now that we've got our dep turned off and Obviously, we already had to get Firefox on there in the last step. So uh, once you get reconnected to your virtual machine, you're not gonna have to do that step. So just disregard it. Sam helpfully puts those in there for folks that like to skip around. And sometimes, you know, they might not do all the challenges. So it's good to have uh, as complete of a set of instructions as you can. And you know, one thing we do is go back and take helpful feedback from students like you and add even more uh, stuff in as we go along. Give everybody a second to get reconnected. Okay, so hopefully everybody's back up. Next thing we're gonna wanna do is launch our uh, shiny new browser that actually lets us do things on the internet. I can go back while we're doing that, I can go back and kill this. Back and kill this server here. So we don't need that anymore. Once you've got Firefox pulled up, go ahead and go to this address. Uh, it'll ask you what you want to do. Uh, what you want to do in this case is to save the file. You don't want to open it, just save it. Save it, click OK and it will save to your downloads file. Uh, just try instead of uh, the Java, just do it, do the uh, task list slash M uh, star to get all of them. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so then once you've gotten that downloaded to your machine, it only takes a split second to do it. Um, 
what you're going to want to do is go down to your um, go down here open your file system up if you go inside your downloads you'll see that you've got a uh, a zipped file in there and you just right click it and select extract all and then it will extract into a folder right here in your downloads file Okay, so once you have that, uh, once you have that bone server um, file extracted, next thing you want to do is open that up. Uh, inside of here, you will see that there is uh, a bone server executable. Um, I don't know that you necessarily have to do this, but I just ran it as administrator. You can probably just, yeah, just like the instructions say, you can just double click it and it will install. Or I mean, it'll run rather. It'll ask us, you know, do you really want to run this? vulnerable server, why yes I do. Please expose me to attackers right now. Turn my firewall off. And here we are, we've got our vulnerable server open and ready. I like the warning here. It's vulnerable software as the name would imply. So we're gonna access it from our uh, attack machine here right now. So let's go ahead and jump back over to our uh, Linux machine, just as we did in the last uh, exercise. Let's go ahead and pull that up. Let's get out of here because we don't really need that same exploit again. Here we are back in our regular shell and I'll just clear this out. You might want to make the font bigger. Yeah, I can probably do that. Yeah, that's much better. Good. Thank you. I want everybody to be able to see it for sure. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for joining us, Robert. We really appreciate you. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to run Nmap again. Now, again, pay attention. We don't want to use uh, we don't want to use this example IP address here. Just as in the last exercise, we're going to scan. Uh, we're going to use our um, we are going to use the uh, IP address for our Windows machine. Uh, so again, we're going to run a very similar Nmap scan. Only this time, we're going to be looking at a different port. So let's just go ahead and grab that. Alternatively, you could just probably use your up arrow and find it, which I think I'm going to do because I'm lazy. Let's just change that port number right there. Uh, we're running the same scan with the same flag, so it should work just fine. That's what they say, a uh, lazy engineer is a good engineer. I'm just take, I just took it and ran with it, we'll see. <laughs> okay. 
So as you can see, our Nmap scan worked well, and it shows us that we've got a vulnerable server running on port 9999, as expected. Great. Hopefully you got the same results. If not, let us know. As with the last exercise, we're gonna open up our MSF console and then we're gonna search for an exploit that meets our needs. So, go ahead and do that. Oh, right. I'm used to having root, but it opened up anyway. Cool. <laughs> So then we're gonna look as he, uh, we're gonna look here and type in bone server. Oh, whoops! Help to use the appropriate verb. Oh, no results. How sad. So. What can we do here? There's nothing pre-baked and ready for us to go. Uh, so we're out of luck, right? No, we are not out of luck. We can make our own server. So let's go ahead and exit our MSF console for now and go back to our regular shell. So now that we're in our shell, Let's go ahead and make a new file. So what we're gonna do is, as you can see, we're gonna enter this line. I think what was happening before when I was trying copy and paste is I just was getting impatient and not waiting long enough for it to actually work. So it's kind of cool to have that working now because when I was testing these out, I was typing them in by hand. Um, so what we're doing with this line here is we're just making uh, a new directory under our, um, a new folder under our root directory. Um, and uh, um, that's because I need to sudo first. Now, I was successful. So let's go ahead now and open up a text file. And here we are in nano. Now, there's another way to do this, which if you should you ever find yourself in a situation where uh, it's, you've got a lot of stuff that needs to move um, onto your host machine. There's a really cool utility uh, called Termbin, and it's a, uh, you can actually use, it's like paste bin for your command line, um, and it's really awesome because you can um, essentially uh, upload and download uh, large amounts of uh, text easily. So it's, hand, it's really handy for stuff like this. I love Termin, it's really cool. So now we've, um, we've started our exploit here with this, this code that Sam has um, so helpfully provided us uh, by grabbing this, all this code right here. And you'll see, this looks like a typo here at the end where it's got N twice, uh, you actually want both of those. So make sure that you get all of that. Don't just like blindly assume that that's a typo when you go and grab these. So you're going to go all the way from here where it says uh, Metasploit template, template uh, down to where the second end is and that's important. So make sure that you grab all this and put it inside your exploit file, okay? So, uh, once you've got that in there, you can go ahead and close the file. And then we're going to jump back into our uh, Metasploit shell. 
But you do need Shudo or it won't find that. I do. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell I'm often doing these on a Kali distro? Okay, so now you've got your shell back open um, and we're gonna look again for that utility that we tried to find earlier. Remember when we searched uh, for Vuln server and nothing came up? Let's try that again. So, uh, what did I do wrong here? You gotta do reload all. That's right. Thank you. Uh, underscore, reload underscore all. There you go. Here we go. So now it's pulling the modules from your machine, including the additional one that you installed earlier. One of the things that really makes me smile about Metasploit is the different ASCII art that loads each time. This so far right now, I actually haven't seen this one yet. And I'm actually just going to take a quick screenshot because this is my favorite one. Um, so yes, honk the planet. Now we're inside of Metasploit. We have found our, found our stuff. Um, reloaded our modules. Let's try it again. Oh, look at that. Now there is an exploit to target our vulnerable server in there where there wasn't before. So very cool. We have our custom exploit ready to go. So let's use it and see what happens. Let's go ahead and grab this to be extra lazy. Okay, and then let's see. Okay. So we go here, we can see some info about it some explanations and it we can see that uh up here at the top it shows us that uh we've got some information that's required like if we try to run the exploits without configuring these options it will be unsuccessful so uh we are going to need to set our uh remote hosts value uh, and we're going to need to uh, select a payload. So let's go ahead and do that. So there's a command for that luckily. Get this over here so we can see both easily. Now if we go down here we're gonna do and then as you can see there's a ton of different ton of different ones that we could use for this quite the array what we're interested in right here is meterpreter so let's go ahead and use that one so let's set our payload with the set command and then we'll type in the path to it. Because remember all this stuff, all these modules are on your local machine. So you're just accessing them. So Windows, Interpreter, and reverse TCP. That'll be our handler. So we'll go ahead and set that and then let's show our options. Okay. So 
success so far. So let's set our local host. Just like we did in the last one. So we're just gonna set, oops, we're gonna set our, our hosts. That's gonna be, again, that's gonna be our uh, Windows machine. And then we're gonna set our uh, local host as well. And that's gonna, again, that will be your Linux machine. We set both those values and let's run the exploit. Ah, so we have a interpreter show. This is good. So let's do a little digging. It's gonna give us uh, everything that starts with Vuln, which obviously we want because of Vuln server. Oh, and here we are. We've got a process ID, and I believe one of those is a flag. Sorry, it's an architecture, not a process ID in this one. So uh, this, I believe, was the one that some folks were having some difficulties with. So uh, those of you that were having trouble with it, hopefully um, this walkthrough, you were able to get to it. If you're still having trouble with it, um, I can help you debug. We can help you debug. Chat. For the um, for the three twelve, um, why is it three twelve? No, three thirty. Which one is this one? Sorry. This uh, one is three eleven. No, three twelve then. For for three twelve for the uh, task three, right in the Metasploit module, mm -hmm. it sends it, it tells you to create the file and you run everything, and then um, you're building a module and you put it in the pieces. And then they tell you if you have any errors, go to the framework that log to look for details. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many errors, I don't know where to start. Okay, well this one, um, I'm actually probably gonna skip this one for now and come back to it. And, okay. Uh, Cause this one's, uh, this one's a bit of a handful. So I think I'm gonna skip this one and come back to it. And uh, we'll do, uh, 320 next, if that's okay. Oh yeah, no worries. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was ready to quit it anyway. Um, I just was curious. Yeah, I'm not surprised that you're encountering a lot of errors <laughs> on that one. That I'm one's... just yeah, looking, I guess for like, when whenever you they run into problems with like a lot of errors where it looked like syntax like usually where's the best place to start like at the top at the bottom or just dive in just dive in you just gotta work through those uh error messages it's almost like a scavenger hunt i feel like where uh you know you're you're or like maybe that's a you know sometimes you gotta hunt for clues and then uh I've got a technique I've used for years. Just delete half of it, throw away a whole bunch of it until the error goes away. Then start putting it back a few lines at a time. That's a good one too. That's a great really one. When you're really lost, that helps. <laughs> that's a that's a very good one too. Um, you know, don't be don't be too attached. Sometimes you just gotta blow it away <laughs> and and add it back in incrementally so you can squash your bugs. Uh, the other thing that I've done a lot of the time, instead of uh, deleting it, is just comment out uh, a bunch of it and then start adding it back in if you don't want to, you know, if you don't want to lose your work or whatever. But uh, yeah, that one's a handful. Another general rule is only fix the first error because it often causes all the rest. True. Okay. EJH, uh, if you get no session was created, Take a look at your Windows machine and see if you have an error message. You, uh, again, you're, it might be GEP. You're using the wrong IP address. I can already see. Oh, you can. Oh, yeah, it is the wrong IP address. She's right. Those aren't the right IP addresses for your machine. They should start with 10. Yeah, oh, and the so, same thing. 
in this private message, I'm seeing uh, from Cherishell, you're using 192.168 addresses. You need to check your Google Cloud Console and use 10 addresses for both. I think machines. she she copy and paste it because the 192.168 was the was what's yeah. in the example. Yeah, which is easy. The addresses that's of the cloud machines, which are using the internal addresses that start with 10. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and that's, I mean, yeah, we've all made that mistake, like, for sure. Oh, yeah. So, did you, did you ever basically. record that second Hashcat example? Uh, we did record it, and the Hashcat example is up there, and we're recording not, this also. Not the, fir the first one, you, you like breezed over it, and when you did it the second time, you like went through. I'm looking for the website that you went to for that example. Website that I went to. You went to a website with the Hashcat and how you set it up? Because when I run, when I run it, I still do not get one of the, uh, um, one of the uh, passwords. And that was the one where you said, yes, it, it put it in the, the oh, um, oh, text the, file. Oh, a uh, website that had an example of how to do it. Yeah. Uh, well, the only thing I got from the website was the fact that it's minus M1000. Oh, okay. And other than that, I'm, you I'm, just, Yeah, I'm using the minus M1000, but it doesn't create, it doesn't create my output file. It just, it, it tells me it's exhausted, like it's did with yours. And it tells me that there's one out of one, but then there's n nothing for me to open. Uh, well, if you use the dash o found one dot text, it should put them in that found file. Yeah, it doesn't create that file for me. Huh. All right, I'll go back to it again. Yeah, I'd go back and do the Linux one. That'd be all right, Judy. Um, uh, all right, and uh, L host is Linux. Any ideas? Okay, let's look and see at what the problem was. Um, uh, Miriam, it could be, uh, it could be the IP addresses. Uh, oh no, oh, you're the one that had the crash. Yeah, if it crashes like that, that usually means DEP is on. Um, did you, you did restart after changing it, right? Because if you change it, but don't restart, it doesn't take effect. Um. Hey, Mariam, uh, you were able to do the previous one okay, right? Uh, with the, um, yeah, okay. So it's not a networking problem, okay. Um, see what else could be the issue here. Um, you, is this a Google Cloud machine? You haven't got any antivirus or anything, right? Okay. Hmm. And mine's on the Google Cloud machine as well. Yeah. Um, and you've got DEP turned off. You've got firewall turned off. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Oh, one idea is uh, there's some setting in here that I found earlier. I, I think I have, I do have an idea. There's some setting in I found in here earlier about like preventing you from running non Windows programs or something like that. Um, yeah, do you have server 2016 or 2019? Yeah, 2016. That's what I used. Hmm. Um, This one, turn this one off. Uh, the uh, Windows smart screen. One server has stopped working. Um, Mariam, uh, this try try uh, try turning this off here. If you go into, um, let's see, let me back out and see how I got there again. <laughs> like this is one of the things that drives me most insane about Windows. Oh, and I close my connection. Great. Hang on. Reconnect.
Tailored Felt Apache MQ Okay. So I think if you turn that off, that might be your problem because it's not going to run that vulnerable. I think it's stopping you from running that oh, no. uh, program effectively. So see if see if uh, that might help, Mariam. Okay, let me back out of that. Yeah, you're just going to uh, control panel um, and then system and security. And then security and maintenance. And then it's right on the, it should be right on the front here under security where turn on or turn off Windows smart screen. And then you just click on the Windows Defender icon logo here on the side. Yep, that's it. And then turn off, do uh, make it so it's don't do anything. And try that. And then after you've uh, changed that, try running the um, try running that vulnerable server program again and see if it works. Already don't do anything. So I'm not sure what the problem. Um, oh, oh, did you remember to uh, restart your Windows machine after you turned off uh, DEP? Nope. Okay, that, I think that's it. So just make sure, try restarting your machine now that it's turned off and then try it again because I suspect that's your problem. Okay, sure, thank you. Sure, no problem. I'm going to give you a second to try that before we do the next one. Well, I'm, I'm going to skip over. Um, I'm going to skip over 312 right now and then uh, just go on to this next one for the time being, uh, the creating a Trojan with Metasploit, which is pretty fun and cool. But I want to give uh, anybody a chance who is still running into issues to try and run that last exploit first. Everything should still be there after you restart. Uh, so you should be able to just go back in and follow the, um, should be able to just go back in and follow the last steps here. Uh, once you get it booted up, where you start up, um, where you start up the uh, vulnerable server. And then after you start the vulnerable server on your Windows machine, you should still just be able to run, um, run the exploit again. Uh, as as here shouldn't have to change anything once you run that again it should uh, should work okay so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move on to this last one here and then uh then we'll still you know we'll still have time to do any kind of debugging or answer questions or anything like that but since we're getting into the last hour i'd like to run through this one with you uh it doesn't doesn't take a real long time to get through it and it's pretty fun so hopefully everyone is familiar with the concept of a trojan uh, so i'm not going to explain that but if you want me to uh, i will Otherwise, we're just gonna press ahead and forge on. So I'm gonna go back to my, I lost my RDP connection again. Let's go ahead and start that up because we're gonna need it.
back out of these settings here. Oh, great. Fantastic. That, RD, that uh, DEP will get you. It was the DEP. She had to restart her machine. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Well, it's isn't that fun when it when it finally just works. Yeah. Doing doing terrible things is a good time. Oh. Probably the Trojan. Yes, we're we're gonna do the Trojan. Oh, now. I see it. Okay. Now. What we're going to do is go back over. We're going to be using the same stuff for the most part. So uh, hopefully you've been able to follow along up to this point. And um, everything's good. OK. So uh, you should already have your, um, you should already have your uh, IP addresses for both machines. And I'm not going to run through the ping test because if you've gotten this far, then your connectivity is okay. The next thing we're going to do uh, is install uh, Apache on our Linux server. So you're going to want to take these and run them. So uh, we should actually probably change these as somebody just mentioned earlier. Uh, they tried to put them all in one line and they won't actually return like that. The way you're going to have to do it is do um, sudo apt update and then hit enter. Uh, next line, you're going to do uh, sudo apt install Apache 2-y uh, and then enter. And then finally, after that all runs, you're going to do this command right here, uh, sudo sslnt. The one thing I will say is don't upgrade. Do not use upgrade here. I found this out the hard way. Uh, if you, because it's it's habit for me to do update and upgrade, but it will break things. So don't do upgrade. Just update. I had to start over. Once you've got them installed, you can do like so. And if everything went OK, you can see here that you've got listeners running. Now, this was where I discovered that it's a bad idea to do upgrade because it breaks the Apache install. Uh, in my case, I did not have uh, listeners running. So hopefully after you've installed, updated and installed, uh, then you run uh, sudo sslnt, uh, then you will see these listeners running on their relevant ports. Now, don't get caught in the uh, don't get caught in the same uh, don't get caught on the same thing here. We're not going to be using this particular IP address. What we're going to do is we're going to hop back into our Windows VM and we're going to open up a browser. I like Firefox for this. Once it opens up. We're going to go up to uh, the address bar here, and we're going to type in HTTP colon backslash backslash, and then we're going to enter in our um, the IP address of our Linux machine. So again, uh, make sure that you're not just copying and pasting this line into the browser bar because you're going to have a bad time. Make sure that you're getting the IP address of your Linux machine. That's what's running the, uh, that's what's running the Apache web server that we're going to be accessing from our Windows machine. So in my case, 
this is the uh, this is the IP address of my Linux machine. So let's go there. Now you can see that it was successful. So it's cool because this now is the uh, the appropriate landing page. Um, if you did everything right and you enter your IP address in here, you should be able to see that landing page of your Linux server. Now, what you think, you might think like, how would attackers use this in the real world? Um, uh, it, always, it does not cease to amaze me how many people will just click on anything once they open an email uh, or even uh, like search results for um, like some of these, some of these, uh, some of this, these Trojans spread through um, malicious websites that are able to uh, populate uh, search index results and people will just click on it, not knowing where they're going. I mean, a lot of this, a lot of the time, um, you know, this is this is a lot better than it used to be, like in the in the late '90s and early 2000s. But uh, it's still um, it's still a major problem. And I mean, I do have some pretty funny stories from people who were like uh, ended up with needing to get their computers fixed. And um, the best one is the guy that. Uh, in front of his wife was asking why he had all these viruses on his computer and we're like well sir <laughs> your hard drive is full of a very specific type of porn <laughs> and you've got trojans all over your computer and he says oh uh we don't look at that stuff in our house <laughs> and we're like well Someone was visiting these sites and installed some malicious software. Uh, people will oftentimes uh, click on anything. There's a reason that um, there's a reason that phishing is still so successful and that people still fall victim to phishing campaigns. Um, a lot of the time, they will disguise links to look like something legitimate. And as you can see in this case, it's very easy. Uh, to get someone to um, click a link and then and then now uh, as here they're already connected to my malicious attacker Linux machine from their Windows machine so they're actually connected to my web server mm -hmm. search bars yes search bars are another good one absolutely does somebody want to say something or, okay, so now that we know that we're uh, connected okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go install, um, we're gonna go install this right here. So uh, you can just copy this link as is, uh, enter it into your uh, address bar right here and go install NPCAT. And then once you go to that site, you'll just go ahead and click right here on the uh, Windows installation link, and then that will download for you. You should be good to go. Again, in the previous line, um, we're gonna flip back over. Next thing we're gonna do is flip back over to our Linux machine. Uh, as in the previous uh, section, make sure that you're, th this is an all one line, even though it, it's kind of deceiving, uh, which we'll, we'll change that on well, the Just refresh it. I fixed it. Refresh the page. Oh, okay. Great. We must be talking about the ones that are further up. Oh yeah, see, so Sam went ahead and refer and fixed that one. Uh, here, this is the same issue applies here. So first thing you're going to want to do is just take this part right here, where it's sudo apt install socat dash y, 
and you're going to go ahead and put that plug that into your um into your linux machine right here so it's going to be oh not copy for me so you're just going to enter it like so so just that much of the line you're going to enter and then you're going to you're going to hit the return key um, of course in my case it was already installed so after you enter that line you're going to enter uh, this next line right here again just a word of caution do not use the uh, example IP address oh wait actually in this case you can use sorry my bad. In this case, you actually can use the example IP address because in this case, it is referring to your, um, your local host address. So essentially, uh, 127.0.0.1 is your home IP and then uh, 80, obviously, is your HTTP port. So once you do that, go ahead and hit enter. How do I turn off Windows Defender real time? Uh, Mine doesn't look like the example, so I'm not finding it. Um, let's take a look at that. Clear, get rid of this here. Come on. I think I found a link. Oh, cool. There you go, Urban. This is like super slow right now. Oh, wow. Claims to be doing good. Come on. Let us know if uh, that's still giving you problems, Jay. Come on. There we go. No, still doesn't want to close for me. Virus and threat detection, okay. Thanks, Caitlin. Mm. Come on. Okay, well, we'll just leave that for now and hopefully it doesn't, uh, I wonder if it'll let me turn it off with uh, task manager, maybe. Possibly, maybe. Try to embiggen it. Not gonna let me do that unless I run it as admin. Good, great. Okay, so back to, back to our instructions here. Let's try this again. Open up our browser and let's hit the Linux machine. And we've already 
ideally uh, uh, Jay was just asking about turning off Windows Defender. So uh, let me go ahead and do that in case I, I think I reset it to default so that I could walk through it with you. Boy, my Firefox seems to be making Windows angry today. So let's kill that. Wow, I didn't even kill through Task Manager. Let's go back here and Defender. And yeah, so we went in here and then turned that off. Typically the default will have it set to on here under real-time protection. Okay, so we've got that off. Um, I just turned it all off because why not? Um, so now we're gonna go back over here to our Linux machine and grab the content from this URL. Actually, we don't need to do that because we, uh, I'm sorry, it's getting a little fried late in the day. We already did that, so uh, hopefully you've, still, you've already got um, Metasploit installed on your Linux server. So let's just move on to this next. Uh, let's move on to this next line. So, Go ahead and kill this for now. I can use my terminal again. Go ahead and enter this line in. And again, being sure to change, be sure to change, uh, this is an instance where you've got to change that uh, localhost IP. So make sure you put in the accurate localhost IP for your Linux machine. It's one of those, I swear. Okay. Sounds good. Now, let's start up our Apache server. So, that should have started our server here. Um, if, if it didn't, uh, you'd see an error right there. Now, let's open our, uh, let's open Metasploit back up. So my payload wasn't created. Hmm, no payload created, huh? Yeah. Um let's let's see. Uh and you changed you made sure to change the IP address and you yep. entered it all as one line, right? Yep. It says no and no platform selected like your has, and then yep. it says no arc selected, selecting arc x86 from payload, and it says error, one or more options failed to validate L host. One or more options failed to validate L host. Uh, is it possible that you might have had a, a typo in there anywhere? Um, can you paste the line in to the chat, please? Okay. This line that you heard. Okay. 
I don't understand. There's like a second ampersand in my, uh, that, not the, the money sign. There's like a second money sign. Mm, that's weird. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm doing the line again. Can you, can you open a new, can you reopen your terminal window? Or just uh, con like control C and uh, control C and then um, type in clear, uh, clear your screen and then see if that helps any. Uh, I'm clear my screen and that just clears my screen and I you still have two dollar signs? Huh? You still have two dollar signs? No, the one dollar sign is gone. Okay, that's good. And then um, I'm running the code again. Okay. Um, I've got the pseudo and my has been on. Yeah, it's still saying a host failed to. Wait a second. Now that's different. Okay, apparently I'll host this 190. I mean, 1,200 and 920. I don't know where that ha what happened there. That's, what? <laughs> I mean, that makes two of us. That doesn't make sense. Because you see the number that, you, you see what I pasted? That, yeah. that's, that's what I had when I entered. But when mm -hmm. I go back and, and you know, when I hit the up key to see what my previous command was, it says yeah. L host equals 1920. Who knows? Uh, but try it again with the actual correct one. That, that one worked. Okay. Cool. Cool. <laughs> I don't know what, maybe the computer's tired at the end of the day, too. I know I am. My brain is fried at this point. <laughs> But I'm glad I'm glad that worked. You know, weird little anomalous things like that happen. So debugging is good times. So after you've uh, restarted your um, Apache server and you have run uh, MSF console and you're back in your uh, Metasploit shell, um, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna type in this command. We're gonna do use. multi slash handler. Okay, so perfect. Well, this is just what we want. Um, we're gonna use this uh, pre-configured um, payload here to handle our, our uh, exploit code. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set our payload to be transferred by the handler. So we're gonna do a set payload as you can see, um, this is this is how you configure the options, uh, whatever they may be. It's just like we did with uh, our hosts, and we're gonna go use the same handler again. We're gonna do Windows interpreter, and then reverse TCP. And tab to complete too, you know. Pardon? Then tab into complete. Yeah. Spell, spell checks and stuff. Right? That's always nice. Um, and then, uh, so we've set that, and then we're going to set our uh, local host again. Um, and if you remember, in the earlier screen, when we ran uh, SSLNT, we saw right here on the output uh, the uh, all zeros address. So that's why we're setting the local host to all zeros again here. Just in case that didn't make sense to anybody, I just wanted to point that out. So we set our handler. Now we're going to set our uh, local host. And we're going to do that to uh, all zeros hit enter and now let's try running our exploit
started our handler. Now, let's run the malware. So we're gonna go back to our Windows machine. We're up here now, and so let's go ahead and pretend that we've just sent our executive uh, malicious uh, link. How can we get, how can we get our executive to download our malicious link onto his uh, work computer? This is a pretty good way. We've got him, or we've already got him coming to our web server. Let's get him to download this malware. I mean, it says it's fun, so CEO is like fun, right? Interesting. Well, we better save it if we want to have fun. So let's save that file. And we we don't want any. We don't want to. We don't want to heed any of these silly warnings for Microsoft Incorporated. Let's just run it. Oops. What could go wrong? Yeah, what could go wrong? It's going to be fun. So, eh, we don't, we're not worried. You, you can just shut up, Windows. We're going to just run this anyway because we want to have fun. Now, Let's go back over here to our machine and look look at what we got. We got a shell. Uh, Maturber has done its job. Let's see what options are available to us here. There's a lot going on there. As you can see, there's a ton of dirty things you can do now that you're in there. Um, you can uh, run these commands to do different uh, different nefarious things um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna play with some of them so uh, huh, you can read some of their files maybe you want to download a file off of your target machine maybe you see want to see what's in their directories um, who knows maybe you uh, might want to get in there and make yourself an account see what their IP address, et cetera, might maybe you really want to have some fun and, uh, you know, do things like remote, uh, like uh, shut their machine down. Maybe you want to run a keylogger and see what they type in. Let's try that one. That sounds pretty fun. So here's what we're going to do. So first off, let's see uh, a list of processes on their computer. So just like in Linux, you're gonna type yes, and wow, they got a lot of stuff going on here. So here's some of the processes that are running on our, our Windows victims machine. Um, and handily, it shows us even like where it is and stuff like that, so that's cool. Um, and then, um, Let's go ahead and get into Explorer. Why not? We're gonna migrate into that process. So here we are. Uh, the, you know, it was a successful in this place, but Sam made the very um, prescient note here in the instructions that uh, the process migration is unreliable. Um, you might succeed, you might time out. Uh, you just don't know what's gonna happen. So I didn't have to troubleshoot, as you can see, it just worked right away. Um, if you did have problems with that, try some of, um, try those steps there to see if any of those were effective. Um, okay. Good, people are getting help. Thank you, Sam. So we'll go back here. Hopefully that was effective for you on the first try. We can come back to this where we're getting a little short on time. So um, we've done the, uh, we've successfully migrated processes. So let's try, um, let, and if you didn't get that, it's really not that big of a deal, it's fine. 
Um, so let's try, um, let's try our next bit of fun. Okay. So let's try this. We could get a screenshot. Um, I think that we should try doing a keylogger. So let's try that. That's going to be the second option here. But you know, you could also watch somebody over their webcam, get a shell on there, uh, a window shell on there, set up some persistence for yourself. Uh, all kinds of good, dirty, and fun things you can do there. Let's look at their system information. Ooh, okay, cool. Gives us some insight into what they're running. Uh, and you happen to get lucky and get a little flag there. So hopefully you've run this and we're able to uh, get that to work successfully. I'm going to show you while we're in here, let's try running the uh, key logger. I think it's key scan. Key scan start. We started that, started sniffing for our keystrokes. And then let's uh, just go ahead and up a notepad eventually. Mm. Slow. Ah. Okay, we're gonna have to reconnect there, but that's okay. Hey, Liz, uh, is it okay yeah. if I stop this recording and take over the screen for a minute so I can uh, see what Cherishell is doing? Um, sure, but just I just wanted to finish doing this one okay. little demo. Of Go ahead. Let me know what it's done. Okay. And then uh, I'll be done in just like a second. I just wanted to show them how it works. but uh, it may not be cooperating, so we'll see. Um, yeah, this is totally not cooperating, so just go ahead and do that. <laughs> oh, wait, there we go. Okay, so it should be still running. Let me um, see if it killed it. I don't think so. So let me uh, let me try that and see if it works still. Uh-oh, looks like we lost Liz. It sounded like she was slowing down. Probably her router finally gave. Yeah. Someone probably hacked her. She's probably oh, a Metasploit or yeah. something and got hacked. Well, I'll stop this recording.